Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, and Ramadan Mubarak. I'm Elizabeth Ashborn. I'm the Executive Director of PQMD, and I want to welcome you all to the Global Health Policy Forum series of regional roundtable discussions. Today's event is the second in our series and will focus on the unique complexities of delivering quality health outcomes in the Middle East, where political, economic, demographic, and social turbulence is an unfortunate and shifting reality. You will hear today from seasoned professionals sharing perspectives on the region's pressing challenges and emerging trends. With decades of humanitarian and development experience, our panelists will discuss regional solutions on how to move health system strengthening forward despite operating under constant and longstanding challenges. We will consider the role of medical product donations, the growing emphasis on caring for the whole health of different communities affected by chronic instability and transience, as well as donor fatigue. For those of you new to PQMD, we are a global alliance of international NGOs and leading healthcare companies committed to advancing the role of product donations worldwide. Founded in 1999, our work is guided by five pillars, humanitarian assistance, health system strengthening, disaster response preparedness, guidelines, and knowledge management. These roundtable events showcase the power of our partnership, and we would like for all PQMB members to always feel as if they are part of a larger extended family full of resources and like-minded people continually working for access to health. This series is an important effort for PQMD. We have designed each round table to highlight the rich interests and expertise of our PQMD family at a regional level. We are so proud to underscore the interconnectivity of the PQMD network. PQMD relies on the strength of our coalition and the work our members do every day to inform our ongoing programming. So please visit our website and our community of practice for upcoming events, practical tools, and to be part of the larger conversation. We will drop those links into the chat box. Um, so please have a look. So welcome again, uh, and please introduce yourself to your colleagues here today by typing your name and organization into the chat box. And additionally, we request all participants remain muted during the main presentation. We want to add to the discussion in real time. So please indicate any questions, comments, or resources you'd like to share in the chat box. We will also be using Slido as a way to engage the audience in a structured way. And to participate in that, please use your camera on any smart device to scan the QR code or go to, go to the www.slido.com and enter the numbered code. And lastly, we are recording this session to post on our website. So now to kick off this discussion, we have the, the incredible honor of hearing from Dr. Faraz Abiyad the Minister of Public Health of Lebanon. Newly appointed in 2021, he will share some reflections with us today to ground our discussion in the spirit of collaboration and advocacy for the health workforce, as well as the most vulnerable populations affected by emergency, war, and disaster. Prior to stepping into his current national position, Dr. Abiyad was the chair of the board of the Rafi Hariri University Hospital. He also led much of the hospital and health response to COVID in Lebanon. Minister Abiyad has practiced medicine as a surgeon for over two decades and received his MD from the American University in Beirut and the School of Public Health at St. Joseph's University. He believes strongly in the power of partnership and has welcomed both international organizations and the private sector to rise to the opportunity to play a valuable role in reshaping healthcare. We are so lucky to have you here today with us to kick off our discussion. Thank you for taking the time in your very busy week. Dr. Abiyad, over to you. Well, uh, first let me start by thanking you and uh, Sean and Amira for the opportunity to uh, address you in front of the, uh, the audience and uh, to share some of our uh, predicaments and, and um, lessons that we have learned from tackling all these uh, different crises that we are facing now in Lebanon. Now, as you know, we, we all live now in, in, a, in a global village. I think that, uh, you know, we uh, now, because of the advancement that we've seen over the past decades in uh, communication technology, uh, all countries in the world are now practically connected. We know what is happening elsewhere. Uh, actually, we 
most of the time can actually have, uh, we can see them live as the events are unfolding uh, on TVs and we can feel whatever is happening uh, around us all over the world. Uh, I think that also what we have learned from what is happening lately, whether uh, the lessons learned from uh, COVID or from other crises, is that crises don't tend to stay in, in one place. I think COVID has shown us very clearly uh, that uh, even you know diseases, they do not uh, acknowledge borders, they do not acknowledge walls, societies, uh, uh, barriers, uh, oceans, uh, and that you know what happens uh, in, in Vegas does not always stay in, in Vegas. I think we've seen also that with uh, the other crisis that we are witnessing at the moment where uh, an event that is happening in a distant country that some has, have not probably heard of, like Ukraine, uh, before uh, now is turning into something that threatens uh, international uh, uh, supply uh, of energy and also uh, uh, something that endangers the supply of uh, uh, globally, uh, food and other uh, essential things that we need uh, to live by. So I think that uh, this is very clear that more and more, whether we wish it or not, whether we accept it or not, we are living in, um, in, in a one world where whatever happens somewhere has an implication on, on all of us. Now, moving from that picture into Lebanon. Lebanon is, is a very small country that probably uh, if compared, for example, the United States wouldn't uh, be equal to uh, probably uh, a, a, a small portion of one of the states, uh, you know, uh, and the population, the total population of the country is a near uh, 4 million uh, inhabitants. However, Lebanon is currently enduring an unprecedented multifaceted crisis for over two years uh, with financial, fiscal, economic, social, health, security, and political downfall threatening the country's survival. The uh, World Bank considers that the Lebanese crisis is one of the financial crises that we are currently passing through, is one of the worst that the world has seen uh, in the past century, one of the three worst, actually. In addition to the protracted Syrian refugee crisis, where we received almost one third of our population, and refugees since 2011. We also uh, have since 2019 uh, started experience, experiencing a severe financial and fiscal crisis. The Lebanese pound has been devaluated by around 13 times against the US dollar. Inflation averaged 145% at the end of 2021, ranking the third globally after Venezuela and Sudan. The minimum wage dropped from the equivalent of uh, 450 US dollars to less than 30 US dollars. And the GDP uh, went through the highest contraction in a list of 193 countries. It fell by almost 55%. And uh, the projected GDP now is 21 billion from the height of 52 uh, billion US dollars. In addition to that, we had the you, uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic that has hit all uh, of the countries of the world. Uh, but that coupled with our uh, severe political instability and our economical hardships, that has uh, resulted in a rapid socioeconomic deterioration and a sharp rise in poverty levels estimated at around 70% for the Lebanese and 90% for the refugees. This has led to the straining of the infrastructure of the country with very limited access to electricity and safe drinking water. In parts of the capital, we only get electricity from the grid for uh, the equivalent of two uh, hours. Uh, we also are uh, witnessing uh, serious uh, food uh, insecurity uh, with shortages in essential foods. Uh, health risks are potentiated, exacerbated by shortages in medications and medical supplies and uh, a massive healthcare workforce exodus where around uh, we've lost around 40 percent of our uh, doctors and our nurses uh, who have left searching for better living conditions for themselves 
or for their uh, families. So all of this has culminated in a very complex uh, health crisis for us. And the obvious question uh, that lie before us at the moment is then can we really be, be able to provide uh, healthcare services not only for uh, the Lebanese but also for the refugee population that is uh, here in Lebanon which is as I said uh, estimated at around a million and a half the equivalent of one third of the population so looking at all of this uh, the question is, as we said, can such a country provide help for refugees and migrants when it is barely able to provide it for its own citizens? Lebanon is still following an all-inclusive approach, but the question is, is it sustainable? And I think that to answer that question, three issues are, uh, are, are important uh, to keep in mind. The first issue is resources, resources. In a low resource environment, it is difficult to convince people who have little to share. Crisis linger, resources get exhausted, and the world forgets or is distracted by other emerging events. A policy of health for all, for example, is based, which is based on foreign aid alone is not sustainable. But how can a broken economy or fractured healthcare system provide for both local and migrant communities. I think this also leads us to the second question, and that is about health system itself. The health system in such conditions needs to be strengthened or fixed, and this is vital, especially in a low resource environment. Yet in the same conditions, the attention of most public health officials is focused on addressing emergent crises and solving acute problems. Decision makers find little time to allocate to system building. Efforts at reform have to be right from the first attempt, as little resources are available for a second attempt. Yet without resource, without reform, acute problems recur and firefighting becomes a work in perpetuity. Finding the solutions that require low resources and making them stick by incorporating this into systems is what is needed. But how? This brings out the third issue. I think what is the key to answering those questions is, I can give it to you in one word, partnership. Partnership is key to deliver such a task. But what, was, what is partnership about? First of all, I think partnership is about burden sharing. Low resource communities, including Lebanon, have shown generosity and have shared their resources with refugees. They should not be left to carry that burden alone. Support in all forms from high income countries is vital to create the required collective approach needed to solve these problems. The second point is that efforts of partners have to be well aligned reinforcing each other. Partnership is about working together, not next to each other. I have seen many projects that came to Lebanon, work in a silo, offer services, but not change. And when they leave, systems are left as before, ineff inefficient and unproductive. And finally, partnership is about building trust through a data-driven, transparent dialogue about priorities, and about reaching alignment about the way forward. This is the only way that will result in a sustainable improvement. We have to get it right from the first attempt. My colleagues, I think that health for all, no matter from where you come from, is a very honorable yet very demanding goal. If reached, it, is, it will be a tremendous achievement, but even if it is not, the journey is worth taking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, Dr. Abiyad. Um, I'd like to ask a, a couple of questions, if I may. You were 
you were the director at Lebanon's largest hospital, Rafiq Hariri University Hospital in Beirut, uh, when the coronavirus started. And in fact, I coincidentally uh, visited you there just four days after you had your first confirmed COVID case and two days after you had split the hospital in two, uh, partitioning it off to have a COVID ward and a non-COVID ward. And I remember we asked you, should we wear masks? And you said, you don't need to wear masks on this side and we need them for the COVID side, so no. And I, I remember thinking your, you know, your clear and, and cool headedness on it and, and your grasp of the situation, even at early days and ability to explain things were critical. And I think you played a, an important role in, uh, in, in, uh, in information about COVID, about vaccines uh, across Lebanon, but it's been a real problem. Um, misinformation and therefore vaccine hesitancy in Lebanon, across the Middle East, and, and indeed across the world. H how do we continue to combat that misinformation and, and specifically and most importantly, I think, on vaccine hesitancy? So thank you. I, th I think that's an important question and I would like to address two parts of it. The first part is about uh, how to handle yourself in times of crisis. And I don't think that there's a, a good playbook for that. Although I think that uh, at Hariri uh, Hospital, uh, the, what was a good preparation is that we had endured several crises beforehand. And I think that, you know, as you pass through these crises, you, you then become better prepared for the ones coming later. And I think that one of the very important lessons that we have learned is uh, to be very, you know, to be very agile uh, because uh, you know, crisis sometimes, the essence of managing them is time. And most of the time, time is, you know, is the least available resource that you have. So I think that this idea of being very agile is quite important. However, having said that, being agile comes with something else. And that is the acceptance of when you are agile, you sometimes can make wrong decisions and you can make mistakes and you have to be ready to address those mistakes and uh, work through them. Now, the reason why this is important is because I think to a certain degree, it addresses what you've mentioned. And that is, I think that the biggest obstacle, the biggest um, uh, issue that has led to this uh, environment of misinformation is when we have a low level of trust. Unfortunately, in Lebanon, with all the failures that uh, you know, the, the government has had uh, over the years in, in building a good economy, building, uh, you know, uh, systems that can address people's need, uh, not able to provide for people uh, what they need. I think that has led to a, a, an environment of very low trust in uh, public institutions or even public figures. And uh, that has meant that unfortunately all this misinformation uh, actually uh, find uh, you know very fertile ground for them to spread and uh, you know in my opinion the best preparation for this misinformation uh, or for this crisis has to start way way uh, ahead you have to prepare for your next crisis you have to prepare for the coming disaster way ahead because i think that if you want to do it while the crisis is ongoing, there is a very high chance that you will not get it right. And even if you get it right, because of the inadequate work that has been done before, uh, it will be right for all of these misinformations that we have seen. And I, I think that the countries that have fared well uh, in, during this COVID crisis are countries that have worked very hard on building a very good public system uh, that has meant that people have a high trust in the public health, uh, you know, measures that were ongoing in that point. Thanks. I wanted to ask on that point, and then I open it up to anyone in the, I have a couple of questions, but anyone else who would like to ask Dr. Abiy a question. I, on that point, you know, some hoped that a global pandemic would bring the world together, that we'd work together to face this global challenge. And it, But most people feel that hasn't happened. Countries have looked inward. There was a lot of vaccine nationalism. Uh, and then you raise the point that we need to be ready for the next one. So I guess two questions. Did, did we lose an opportunity to come together to face this? And are we preparing 
for the next pandemic and doing it beyond our national uh, borders? Did we lose those opportunities? Is it too late? Well, I, I don't think that we've lost that opportunity. I think that what we can see all over the world are two things happening at the same time. I think that you have uh, people's attitudes and what they do. Uh, you can see that there are two trends. There are people who look completely inwards, societies that look inwards, and try to see you know, how much they can hoard, how much they can preserve what they already have. Uh, and uh, you know, this is the environment, for example, where people try to uh, put the me first, uh, you know, before uh, looking at the general benefit of, uh, of, or the welfare of societies. And I think that you have also seen people who have, uh, on the contrary, I think that they have seen in this crisis the opportunity uh, to work more on a more, uh, not only global, but sort of a more cooperative stage where uh, they are actually, they see them this an opportunity to get out of this by working together. I think that we are seeing uh, those two approaches. Uh, and I think that here it is extremely important to enforce the message that I think it's only societies who have worked well together or countries that have worked uh, with each other that are able then to bring us out. I think that what is clear to me is that the more individualistic our approach is, whether to our own good, uh, irrespective of what happens to our society, is will lead us to a more detrimental outcome at, at the end. And I, I do see that, you know, whether this is the yin and the yang or or what, what you want to call it. But I, I, I can see in society at the same time, uh, you know, uh, both of these. And, and this is what crises do. They bring out the best in people and sometimes they bring out the worst in people. Are you seeing examples of good regional collaboration in, in the Middle East? Are you part of discussions either on continuing to face the current challenge or prepare for the next? And, and we can segue beyond COVID as well and talk about um, uh, the strain on, on, on global and national health systems. What are you seeing in terms of good uh, collaboration? I think, you know, Lebanon passing through its, its current crisis, uh, you know, I, I think that there has been a lot of lessons learned. But one of the things that I see uh, when I travel abroad and we meet with uh, our colleagues from other countries is that they really have shown a sincere interest in coming and supporting Lebanon. I think not only from other uh, colleagues from the region, but we have seen this uh, internationally. I think that the response that we have seen, for example, after the Beirut blast, where really we've seen a tremendous amount of support that came to the country whether in supplies, whether in personnel, uh, whether, you know, different kinds of resources. Uh, that was really very heartwarming. But the question, uh, obviously, is how to make it have a bigger impact and how to make that sustainable. Here, you know, I, I have an, a, a, an, a theory. I think that uh, a lot of the time we ask whether, you know, what is better, to, uh, humanitarian support to make you survive or development support that you know make the systems stronger i think going back to the old kind of what is better you know feeding a hungry person or teaching them how to fish and and the answer that i give to that question is that it depends if somebody is almost dying of hunger then obviously feeding them is a priority whereas if they are in a better state then teaching them how to fish then becomes the priority and I think what we need uh, at the moment in Lebanon and in several uh, you know, areas of the region is these projects that have this dual nature. They are humanistic or humanitarian, but at the same time, they fit within a, 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 a project of system strengthening. Uh, and that will allow, hopefully, countries not to be stuck uh, in perpetual need for, for aid. Uh, but it will allow them to gradually get out of that, uh, that position. Thanks. I'm sticking regionally for a moment, I mean, you know, there's there are income inequalities, economic disparities across the world in, in many developing regions. It's it's particularly acute. In the Middle East, it's, it's really quite something. I mean, you have not just uh, within countries and across populations, but, but the, the breadth of disparity 
by country within the region. Qatar is the world's richest uh, country by capita, and Yemen is the world's uh, gravest humanitarian uh, crisis with huge levels of poverty. And the economic crisis, as we've discussed in Lebanon, has brought many more in Lebanon uh, into poverty and extreme poverty. So the disparities are huge. Some of the solution has to be uh, support from neighbors, and we've seen a lot from the Gulf countries, both in the region and around the world, stepping up on humanitarian assistance and development aid. But I think we also see some missteps sometimes. You, I think you and I talked about how in the aftermath of the Beirut blast, one very well-meaning country in the Gulf set up some field hospitals that never got fully used because they, they, they hadn't thought it through. They weren't used to it. So I think this uh, audience from the Partnership for Quality Medical Donations would love to hear your thoughts on how we ensure we're doing the right thing. First, do no harm. Um, how, are we, how are we supporting both humanitarian crisis and long-term development needs and the strain on health systems in the right way? And, and, and for message for, for your neighbors as well. I think that this is a very crucial question. And the reason is because there isn't enough resources for all the crisis that we are seeing. I think that this is very clear. And I think that you know what we are seeing that a lot of those crises tends to now linger uh and now we're seeing we're moving from the syrian crisis to the yemeni crisis and now we have the ukrainian crisis and we don't know what other crises will become and because of that it's very clear that no country has enough resources to manage all those crises so then it becomes of paramount uh, importance for the resources to be utilized well and here going back to my point about partnerships because I think that in, in a lot of those um, cases that you mentioned, Sean, what happened is that countries decided that, you know, this is what they, I mean, I don't know why was the decision, for example, to set field hospitals, whether that is something that, you know, was discussed with, for example, Lebanon or with others. Sometimes we used to see, uh, for example, medications of one kind coming to the extent that we would have two years supply of that medication, whereas other medications, for example, we would be having an immediate shortage. I think that that's why in a partnership, the dialogue is extremely important. And in a dialogue, it's extremely important for both parties to be transparent and to create this level of trust by which uh, I think, you know, it's not, uh, uh, you know, I don't see any problem with, for example, uh, a donor uh, coming and saying, look, this is something we cannot do, or we do not have the means and to see whether we can work around this issue to see how we can address such shortages, for example. At the same time, I think that if we, you know, what I've seen is that sometimes uh, aid or support, you know, would be uh, in the sense of people coming and giving you sort of uh, all kinds of uh, resources, whether you need them or not. And sometimes without planning how those resources fit within a grander scheme a grander scheme of system strengthening. Now, I have to mention here that the role of system strengthening has to be fall on the recipient uh, society or recipient country. And it befalls on us here in Lebanon is to decide how we are going to uh, strengthen our system, what are the ways and means, and where then uh, the supporter, the funder, the donor, then comes in and then comes in within those uh, plans. And I think that engineering those aids, uh, those supports is, is, is extremely important. Uh, I think that this is an area where I see sometimes is missing. At Hariri, we were able to do that with the International Committee of the Red Cross, but it took us years in the making to be able to reach this high level of coordination. And I think that for a lot of humanitarian agencies, they don't have years. It's usually the cycle is between six months to one year, then they have to move on. And unfortunately, that means that a lot of the time, the aid that comes uh, doesn't have the, 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 the necessary or the desired impact. So to Thank you. I, I wanna ask one last question that will, is very relevant again for this audience, this Partnership for Quality Medical Donations. We've talked about how medical donations allow a health system or allow a hospital, as we talked at Rafi Kariri, um, to then you know, shift those that budget that would have gone to, to buying medicines 
um, into other priorities. Can you talk a little bit more about that so people have a sense of what it means to provide uh, medicines and medical supplies, what it can mean for support of the health system? Indeed. So I think that, you know, one of our problems at Harry, and I imagine a lot of other hospitals at the same time, was our operational budget. And sometimes you get crises which you, you just cannot expect. For example, shortages in fuel or shortages. In, and suddenly, for example, this uh, blackout in electricity, where now you have to buy fuel to be able to run your generators for 22 hours. And this suddenly become a big black hole in, in your budget. Now, obviously, the, uh, the, the, the importance of aid, uh, for example, medications, medical supplies, is then it allows you to free part of that budget that then can be reallocated to block to, to plug that hole that has suddenly emerged and i, I think that this is something that uh, we we tend to do uh, sort of on, on daily basis and to be able to to shuffle resources uh, to be able to place them in a way to allow the system to to continue and it's a daily struggle i think that the the uh, importance of that is that sometimes it does not allow us to spend the required time uh, on issues such as thinking how to strengthen the system and issues on uh, you know how to build a better uh, institution a stronger more resilient institution uh, and uh, but i think that that is necessary because if it is not done if we only keep firefighting then we will find ourselves just running uh, in circles here your Excellency Minister, Dr. Abiyad, thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. We're going to go to the panel and, and we've invited you to stay for as long as you can. And thank you. Thank you very much for joining us and, and for that intervention. I'd like to introduce uh, Rebecca Milner. She's going to moderate the panel. Rebecca is the Chief Advancement Officer at International Medical Corps, uh, a long time and a critical member of PQMD. And in this role at, uh, at IMC, she mobilizes partnerships resources and awareness and support of IMC's programs that reach more than 10 million people a year globally. Rebecca. Thank you, Sean. Uh, really appreciate uh, your um, remarks with Dr. Aviad. That was um, an incredible kind of overview of the issues that um, face Lebanon, but also many of the countries across the region. Um, so just to set the scene for today's discussion, I wanted to share an overview of the drivers shaping conditions in the Middle East and the tremendous challenges we face in delivering essential services. Uh, but before we get into that part of the panel discussion, uh, we do have a couple of questions for the audience. I uh, wanted to uh, make sure everybody was uh, up and paying attention. So we have a couple of Slido questions. Sam, if you're gonna run that for us. Um, all you have to do is uh, hold your phone up to the screen um, and access the QR code, and that'll take you directly into the Slido uh, session um, where we can um, survey, survey our audience. Um, so our first question today is, what brought you here uh, to listen to this discussion on challenges in the Middle East? How's that coming? There we go. Okay, we have a lot of experienced uh, people who have um, a lot of history uh, in the region. So that's great. That's great. Um, all right. So for our second question, uh, what do you view? as the biggest crisis in the Middle East right now? Um, this, is a, this is a word cloud question. So let's just see what everybody thinks. What's, what do you view as the biggest crisis uh, right now across the region? Refugees across the region, Yemen, financial issues, political conflict, economic instability. I think it's interesting how many people have chosen refugees. Corruption, certainly an issue. I think that gives us a good 
overview of the challenges that, that we do face. Um, all right, here are a couple of questions uh, to test your knowledge. Um, how many Syrian refugees are hosted by countries in the region? Oh, we, we gave the question. Ah, we answered the question. All right, <laughs> so everybody knows, that's right. Um, so yes, uh, 5.6 million uh, Syrian refugees are hosted by other countries in the region. Um, and then there are another million uh, Syrian refugees across that have been scattered across the globe. Um, but I think the important thing to recognize there is that essentially a third of the country, a third of, of the country citizens have left Syria um, and are now um, kind of dependent on assistance from, from uh, their neighbors in the region. Okay, here's another question for you. Next one. All right, this country has 20 million people in need of humanitarian assistance in 2022. Which country is it? Iraq, Syria, or Yemen? I think everybody's voting for Yemen. And, it's, and Yemen is correct. That's the, um, there are more than 20 million people in Yemen, which is essentially 80% of the country's population that are in need of humanitarian assistance. It's quite dramatic. And then uh, our final question, I think, is which country in the Middle East has the largest number of refugees per capita? And I think Dr. Abiyad uh, spoke a little bit about that. That's correct, it's Lebanon. Um, one in four people are not originally from Lebanon. Uh, there. All right, so that was just some fun uh, kind of testing your knowledge questions. Um, but we'll go ahead and, and dive into our panel. I mean, as, as you all know well from uh, Dr. Abiyad's remarks um, and just in general, the issues that we all face every day, um, years of conflict continue to cause crippling humanitarian consequences in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, let me start by sharing just a few numbers. Uh, more than 55 million people across the region need humanitarian assistance, including more than 12 million people who are internally displaced inside their country. Uh, conflict is, a de is devastating communities across the region and increasing protection risks for women and girls and indiscriminate attacks on schools and hospitals prevent meaningful access to services. Many refugees and displaced people in Iraq, Lebanon, Libya, Palestine, Syria, and Yemen live in poor conditions in camps and informal settlements with really limited access to basic services. Uh, the effects of conflict are compounded by reoccurring climactic shocks and extreme weather conditions, including floods and extended droughts. The frequency and magnitude of these shocks is increasing year over year. Layered on top of all of that, the socioeconomic impacts and containment measures associated with the COVID-19 pandemic have increased pre-existing vulnerabilities and stretched already weakened healthcare systems. Vaccination rates remain low and vaccines continue to be difficult to access. Across the region, many countries are battling economic collapse, including soaring food and fuel prices, currency depreciation, limited household revenue, and rising unemployment. Families just can't afford basic goods and services. Food insecurity and nutrition have continued to worsen with millions of people in Lebanon, Syria, and Yemen on the brink of hunger and resorting to negative coping mechanisms. Famine-like conditions are evident in parts of these countries. Delivering quality health outcomes is complex work even in the most stable environments. This complexity rises significantly when it collides with political, economic, demographic, and social instability. Yet, this life-saving work must be done, and it's something that we're all committed to doing. Uh, today, we'll talk about how we can work through and around these challenges uh, with colleagues from World Vision and ANERA. Our panelists each have decades of humanitarian and development experience and will help us delve into how we can move health system strengthening forward despite operating under these difficult conditions. We are delighted to have Rami Shama, Operations Director of World Vision Lebanon, 
and Dima Zayat, Lebanon Deputy Country Director for, for NARA with us today. Um, Sam is gonna place their bios in the chat so that you can see their backgrounds. Um, both have deep experience in the region and are looking forward to sharing their thoughts. Um, so let's just uh, jump right in. Uh, this is a question for both of you, Rami and Dima. Um, from the work you do to help improve the health and well being of vulnerable people in the Middle East, and from where you sit and what you see on a daily basis, what's the one key takeaway you want to ensure that all of us walk away with today? Rami, you want to give us a start? Yeah, uh, thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, PQMD, for this opportunity. Dr. Uh, Abiyad, thank you as well for the introduction. I guess it sets a good scene for us to be able to have a good and efficient discussion. Uh, there are so many takeaways, I guess, from Dr. Abiyad's uh, intervention. But my main takeaway from, uh, from my side is that uh, don't lose the vision. Uh, keep your eyes on the compass. And here, what I mean is that we should always keep the people in the center of what we do how we think of our interventions, how we design them, how we implement them, how we get feedback and improve them, all of this. With a dynamic environment, I think the best input that we can have about the changing needs are from the people. So we need to communicate with them. We need to ask them what they are going through and listen to their stories because these are the stories that matter. In the last years, when many of us started looking at events in numbers, statistics, data, reports, I found that the most valuable information from the field is the human stories. And more importantly to the teams as well, stories from the fields are the ones that pull up the drive to work more and work better. They are the ones who provide us with hope. They are the ones who provide us with uh, the energy to give, uh, to give and to have impact. Uh, and as well, I can give a very small example on how these uh, small, stories actually really uh, pitch in. So when we asked one of the children in the Bika a few uh, weeks back um, on the impact of the, uh, not having bread in their house, considering that the wheat, uh, we have a wheat crisis now with the Ukraine crisis um, taking place, a 14-year-old boy named Christian, uh, he said, nobody can live without bread. And if one day comes and we cannot buy bread, I will stop my education and start working to help my family. Such stories and such quotes actually make us understand how much uh, we, need to, uh, we need to intervene and in what way we should intervene. And this would be my key takeaway. That's a really important one. Dima? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Dr. Firas and Sean for the amazing introduction. Well, I want to borrow uh, one of the sayings that uh, Dr. Firas mentioned, what happens in, uh, in Vegas stays in Vegas. In, in the Middle East, what happens in the Middle East never stays in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And that's negatively and positively. So, uh, but of course, from my intention, I mean the positive things. Uh, because although we are uh, suffering from many challenges, uh, economic, uh, social, political, corruption, etc. Uh, but the Middle East is still a place, a, a source for a lot of good research. It's a source for good education so far, even in, in the worst situation that we are in, um, for creativity and for opportunity. Um, we work at Anera, we work with many young people in different uh, communities, Palestinians, uh, Syrians, Iraqis, Lebanese, um, and uh, I can see that they, they all have great potential and given the chance, given the, the right education, uh, good health care and opportunity, I think, uh, I, I don't think, I believe and I'm sure they can be uh, an asset for the world, not only for, uh, for their countries. Um, and you can see from our latest crisis here in uh, Lebanon, how many doctors and nurses, high quality doctors and nurses, board certified, uh, that have uh, unfortunately left our country to other countries. Uh, so um, that, that's, that's the takeaway I want to, to say that we can give much more than maybe we can take. Uh, mm -hmm. The Middle East is not only a source of, of uh, trouble, it's also a source of hope and, and peace and uh, uh, innovation. 
Right. I mean, when you center, uh, when you put people at the center of all the services that we deliver every day, um, the benefits will extend to the community, you know, to the family, to the community, and then globally. I think um, both you, Rami, and Dima make that point uh, uh, quite quite well. Um, but as we are dealing with all of the many uh, challenges in the region, um, let's talk a little bit about how we can move health system strengthening forward. I mean, Dr. Abiyad made the point uh, about how critical partnerships are. Um, maybe, Rami, you want to build on that a little bit? Yes, definitely. Uh, so I'm going to, to start a little bit of, of, uh, from a macro level. If you look at the whole Middle East region, well, we have been on an ongoing fragility, if you want to call it fragility, since forever, or at least for as far as I can remember. But recently, since 2010, uh, so if you want to look at the past 12, uh, 12 years, the region witnessed conflict, displacement, migration, increase in basic needs, and recently COVID-19, and definitely the impact of all of these crises on the economic situation in all of the countries. For others, this can be considered to be overwhelming. Okay, the question that I pose to myself every single day, and honestly, I don't have the answer to it, how are children coping with all of this? You know, for children who can understand a little bit of the situation, we can work with them on ways to deal with stress. But for newborns, for a one-year-old who is facing malnutrition, lack of medical supplies, no access to hospitals, what can they do? My main answer to all of the re things related to system strengthening, including the healthcare uh, intervention, there needs to be a system in place first. The system starts with the government. When we talk about the government, we talk about the public institutions they, that they built, built and they lead on a coherent system that provides the needed care. So in the Arab region in general, governments are either dysfunctional, they work with uh, very little vision, or they fact focus on macro level approaches, political things. They sometimes lack funding to meet the needs of the people. They sometimes lack leadership or a combination of those. So this urges, if you wanna look at the uh, triangle of development or humanitarian, you have the government at the top and you have the international community or the civil society or the uh, NGOs, and you have the private sector as well. Uh, as as much as this is helpful and can fill the gap for a certain period of time, the interventions from the public, private sector and the international community, this is not sustainable. Dr. Abed was talking about the sustainability and the impact. This is crucial. And if governments cannot continue, uh, the governments cannot continue to, do, to rely on external or even internal entities to do the job. The main important thing that they need to do is to level up and to lead. My call is for all of the government that when you, have, when you need support, you will find us as organizations, you will find us as individuals, you will find us as private sector companies who are willing to Oh, did we lose Rami? Yeah, sorry. Oh, you back? <laughs> I, okay. I, I was muted. <laughs> okay, so my call on the government is that we, we need to create the systems, we need to build the systems so that we can actually support each other in the partnership approach that Dr. Firas Abiyad was talking about. One, uh, there are definitely other components, but one last thing is that as actors in the humanitarian field, we need to see the response from a broader perspective than just focusing on, on parts of the systems. Uh, one of the main things we learned in different responses in Lebanon is the importance of networking and collaborating. So when we talk about the people, we talk about serving the most vulnerable population, but also shaping complementary approaches to different interventions. This way, when we talk about system strengthening, it is stronger, more coherent, and definitely efficient in responding to the needs. Mm -hmm. I think those are really good points, Rami. I mean, Dima, I mean, Rami mentioned that, I mean, since 2010, but really for decades, there's been a lot of need um, in, in the region, in the Middle East. And, and as we're all, as humanitarian actors, as development actors, as, as private sector companies, we're all really 
um, working to strengthen the, the sort of um, support networks that exist on the ground, but how do we continue to advocate um, and prevent uh, donor fatigue when the needs are growing and yet we know the job isn't done, but it's now two decades later. How, how do we kind of make that case? Um, I'm happy you are asking about uh, donor fatigue. Actually, in, in my view, donor fatigue is just another phase of, of, uh, of general fatigue that we are suffering from. Uh, uh, for example, media fatigue or COVID fatigue or online meetings mm -hmm. fatigue. So donors are not different from everyone else, uh, right. be it uh, individual donors or uh, institutions. Uh, so I think donors want to experience something new and exciting, like every one of us who, who is feeling the fatigue. They want to make sure that uh, uh, any resources that they give are, are, are there to start something new or to spark uh, uh, to start a spark that will bring uh, some kind of, of change, meaningful change for them uh, and for what they represent. Um, I think sometimes humanitarian organizations and development agencies get distracted by fundraising for the sake of fundraising and forget why they do what, what they actually do, why, why they are there, their cause. Um, and they may be in, in some uh, sectors, it's, it's all about the money, but not in our sector. Our interest is, is uh, that our cause stays relevant uh, and alive in the minds and hearts of the people um, long before we seek financial support. Uh, we want them to be part, uh, we want them to be part of, of what we are doing, to be on our side in the cause that we are serving. Because every organization has a cause, of course, that's how everything starts. Um, and when we start to lose the, the drive, we, we tend to lose donors as well. Um, but when, when, uh, when we treat donors not as just money-making machines for us, but through partners, I think that's the best scenario we can ever have. Uh, this way, money becomes only one part of the partnership. Um, and the, the, the relationship with the, don with the donor uh, keeps getting richer with time. I can reflect on, uh, on one recent uh, um, experience that I had. Uh, with one of our donors, uh, he's, uh, uh, he's a doctor and he uh, uh, provided us with a very generous donation to start a BS uh, nursing scholarship fund. And he was involved in project conceptualization, uh, selection of uh, students, um, the, the interviews, uh, all, uh, even the performance follow-up, the student performance follow-up. So besides the generous monetary contribution, the donor also contributed to uh, his time and, and to the actual project itself. Uh, the same can be said about institutional or corporate, do corporate donors, of course, when they use what they have to serve the uh, partnership even more and to make it richer. I think having the donors uh, involved, not only uh, as uh, um, uh, contributors, financial contributors, but also as active members of, the, of our community, of the organization, I think that's, uh, uh, that makes the whole difference. Right. Oh, those are really good points, Dima. I mean, I think um, it's it's multidimensional partnerships, right? That that incorporate um, all aspects of how we're going to deliver these services and keep people at the center of the work. And it's also showcasing success, right? I mean, not focusing so much on the need, but really focusing on progress and showing um, success and progress along the way. Um, I mean, Rami, I mean, do you have some success stories? I mean, I, maybe in, um, you, you kind of mentioned the, the impact of, of these protracted crises on, on um, children and, and children's mental health. But maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the successes that, that World Vision is seeing um, through, their, through their program work. Sure, thank you, Rebecca. Um, I mean, definitely the psychosocial needs are increasing all over and not only due to conflict but also due to food insecurity with children being taken out of school early marriage uh, violence and gbv uh, gender-based violence inside the houses and increasing def definitely increasing levels of malnutrition due to an adequate diet this then impacts as well the, the caregivers and looking after their children and leads to more mental health issues we're looking at you know if we want to describe Lebanon, Dr. Abiyad described Lebanon as going through multifaceted crisis and the house it's the same thing it's a multifaceted mental health uh, you know impact on um, different members of the families. So in one of the pro in one of our projects 
uh, the main intervention was psychosocial support. But the focus of this project, uh, which was quite unique for us, it was on faith and development. So a concept that I can proudly say that World Vision is in Lebanon, but also in the world, is strong in. So this is where we mobilize faith leaders and faith-based organizations to protect children. And it was a range of different activities that we had children participate in. This was one of the components I can say that in one of the activities, one of the uh, children who is a scout member, his name is Eli, he's six years old, and he's from Tripoli. He said, I like that I'm learning new stuff and playing at the same time. So this gives, this gives us an idea about the way that we would need to empower those children through non-traditional interventions, and that can be a little bit of uh, interesting for them to participate in. Tatiana, who is a previous scout member herself, is pleased with this opportunity that she was able to facilitate and help the younger generations in the, uh, in the activities. And she said, as per World Vision's curriculum, we are teaching the children about violence, general idea about the situation, how to handle stress for the children, cyber safety, bullying, and many other topics. The, other, the interaction during the sessions is very motivating to keep going and the children like to be engaged. It provides us an idea about the impact of such activities, not only on the children, but also on the facilitators and the trainers. So this is another layer that we can, uh, that we can uh, work on. One of the other highlights as well is that when we work with children, we also need to take care of them in the house or in the home. So also we work with the caregivers and we do positive, we did positive parenting sessions for them so that they can know exactly how to cope with the stress that they are living in and how to deal with the children in, uh, in, in the household. You know, one of the main uh, reports from World Vision uh, was mentioning that 18 million children were impacted by COVID-19 in terms of uh, the violence that is present in their household all over the world. And this was a shocking number for many of us. And it gives us an idea about the role that the caregivers can, uh, can play in improving or at least stabilizing the mental health uh, in, the, in the household. So the main success here that I want to shed light on is the holistic approach, which has definitely taught us a lot in how we need to approach mental health related challenges and not only tackle it from one side, but rather from different sides that can actually, uh, that can actually have an impact on the children and the family's well-being. Right, right, there's no health without mental health, right? Um, I mean, you know, the pandemic was certainly um, traumatic for, for everyone around the world. Um, but I guess, I mean, kind of building on that, Dima, I, I mean, the, the challenges that exist in a place like Palestine are, you know, multi, sort of multidimensional and the, the restricted access that, that the world has to Palestine and to the people of Palestine. I mean, can we talk a little bit about the situation there and how we can overcome um, challenges in extending quality medical and mental health care to refugees in, in Palestine or to communities in Palestine? Rebecca, I want to, to start with saying that it's very important before venturing into any intervention, any health intervention or other, other uh, kind of intervention, uh, is to, to, uh, to improve the quality of health, let's say, is to understand what, what, uh, what is there in the community in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to understand the healthcare system itself, um, the public healthcare system specifically, the health financing, uh, the strengths, the, the gaps, the opportunities for impactful interventions. Um, and I wanted to mention before that the Middle East is such a, a diverse uh, place. It's, uh, the, the term uh, uh, Middle East is a geopolitical term. It does not represent uh, um, a whole uh, uh, yani one community because we are different communities. Uh, so the case of Palestine specifically is a very peculiar case, I think, around the world. Uh, Palestinians are geographically and socially isolated. I think many of the people who are participating in this uh, uh, session know about this. Uh, they are divided into different uh, uh, territories across, across their uh, homeland. Uh, their mobility within the same city is blocked by uh, physical barriers, the separation wall, um, extensive network of uh, checkpoints. Um, and other forms of, of movement restriction. And that's every single day of their lives. 
what what does that mean for for the average person in everyday life this means that if i need a, a, to to go uh, to use an ambulance to transfer my uh, a family member my parent to uh, a hospital from west bank to jerusalem let's say um, i might face uh, life threatening delays because of the checkpoints uh, many specialized hospitals in uh, in uh, Palestine are located in East Jerusalem, uh, but Palestinians sometimes are also denied uh, permits to travel to uh, East Jerusalem, even if they need uh, if they are in dire need of uh, uh, emergency medical attention. This also means that delivering medicines and supplies across the dispersed territories in Palestine are too complicated. Uh, in Gaza, it's not only complicated; it's almost uh, crippling. It, you you can barely work. Uh, in Gaza for, for organizations like ANERA, thankfully, it's been um, quite some time that we have built uh, a very good uh, network and connections, and uh, we, we know the system by heart by now, so uh, we are able to operate in uh, such uh, um, uh, in under mission impossible, let's say. Um, I have to say that, that also the, the Palestinian healthcare system is, uh, is very uh, weak. The infrastructure of the Palestinian healthcare system is very weak. Uh, they have a lack in, uh, in several uh, um, specialties. Uh, the, the blockades from, uh, from uh, the Egyptian borders, not only from the Israeli borders, are also uh, uh, strangling um, Gaza. Um, the, the hospitals lack a lot of uh, the minimum uh, uh, supplies and even uh, sorry the equipment and even when they have equipment sometimes they don't have the expertise to operate such equipment um, so uh, if, if we want to ask about how how we can preserve quality in such a uh, um, uh, environment the best thing to do is first to to use the the local network to to work at the community level and uh, to work like for an era, we have uh, local uh, employees uh, who know their uh, their uh, um, community very well um, and are, are qualified to give the service in, in the best way possible. And I, I want you to mention the importance of standard uh, uh, care. We at uh, I think uh, uh, being part of PQMD, for example, we get a lot of standards and e even these standards can be uh, implemented if we tailor them in a in a uh, good way, uh, we can uh, still preserve the high standards, even in very uh, difficult uh, situations and uh, operational environments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I mean, I mean, to your point, I mean, some of these things, are, the, the themes are coming out, emerging, like coming, uh, putting people at the center of all that we do, working at the community level, partnerships and, and strengthening uh, local networks. I mean, all of those things uh, apply to any of the countries that we're talking about. Um, I, I, I guess I, I wanna switch gears a little bit and come back to you, Dima. Um, Hannah from IHP is asking around, um, in addition to donor fatigue, we also find that product donors have restricted markets in the Middle East which limits the ability to meet health needs. This is particularly the case in Lebanon. And she's asking, what can we do as PQMD to help ensure enough product donations can be sent to the Middle East to meet the increasing needs? And Dima, that's something that you deal with. So I thought potentially you could feel that question. Um, well, it, it all starts with the need. It's important to understand the local need and I think uh, uh, Dr. Abiyad can also uh, comment on this if, uh, if he wants. The local need is, is very important for us to, to take into consideration before making any donation. And that's what we do at Anera, whether in Palestine or Lebanon or, or in Jordan. So we don't just accept anything that is given to us, but we also share our needs on a regular basis with our donor base. Um, and uh, and uh, the needs is not only, they don't come from our office, they come from consultations with the uh, healthcare providers, with the Ministry of Health, uh, different uh, directorates at the Ministry of Health for primary healthcare, for tertiary, for uh, uh, hospitals, for cancer. So um, uh, always we are in, in continuous consultations in order to know what the needs are. And we are updating our needs on a co uh, continuous basis. Mm. I mean, I think that um, PKMD can serve as a convener to really kind of 
collaborate and talk about um, how we can get the, the, the donations of medicines to the right countries at the right time. Um, I, I think, you know, as we're talking about partnerships and collaboration, I do think that, um, you know, working together to make the case to um, private sector and institutional uh, donors that can help us meet those health needs, whether it's through cash or product donations, um, is certainly something that we can continue to work on together. Um, uh, I guess we have a few other questions. Uh, I guess um, maybe Rami, you could speak to how uh, we are countering the negative effects of instability on children. You know, how we're helping um, families deal with the lack of registration, the lack of access to services, um, you know, really putting children at the center and how we can support them. Yes, actually, this is one of the main uh, main issues that face children who are not registered. So we have uh, in Lebanon uh, around 15,000 or 16,000 children who are not registered uh, due to different reasons uh, from their families uh, or due to their inability sometimes to go out of the uh, camps that they are living in. For example, if they are living in Palestinian camps, and they are not able to go out. So uh, as part of our work, as I said before, the government needs to take lead on this. So the good thing here is that the Ministry of Social Affairs actually has a committee that combines a different number of organizations that work on uh, supporting children with no IDs. But this remains a, a big issue because uh, children with no IDs can have no access to schools, can have no access to uh, medical support in case they need this medical support. They cannot have their uh, documents legally made in case they want to travel or go away uh, out of even the area that they are living in. So there is, uh, there is this component present. One of the things that we are working on is on the psychosocial support level, one, uh, where we are providing support uh, for mental health as well for uh, the children and for their parents but at the same time trying with the government agencies. So we're talking about the, inter, uh, the ISF, so the police and uh, the, uh, the internal security to be able to try uh, to provide them with the legal documentation and the legal process and how they can receive this documentation in co coordination with the uh, either mayor or the Mukhtar who is present in the area so that we can provide them with the service that they need, but at the same time work on, uh, on their legal documents. Well, I mean, and that takes many uh, actors uh, to get involved in that, right? I mean, and maybe Dima, you could speak a little bit to the power of, of networks and collaboration to improve um, access to um, health services and other services in the region. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how yes. Anera does that. Of course, I want to talk about how Anela does that and 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 how and what what worked for us not only uh, with Anela but with many organizations. So in Lebanon, um, we have uh, uh, working groups that are. Uh, uh, and although we have many problems in Lebanon, but we also have some good things happening. So the coordination working groups, uh, one of the best coordination working groups is actually the health working group in, uh, in Lebanon, which is supervised by UNHCR and uh, um, uh, the Ministry of uh, Public Health, but also includes all the actors, all the, all the humanitarian and the uh, health actors in, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, and we coordinate together uh, under several responses, unfortunately, we don't have one res response to for 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 the all for the whole of Lebanon. We have several responses, like the emergency response plan. We have the Lebanon crisis response plan for Syrians. We have uh, Beirut blast. We have COVID nineteen. We have several responses in one country, one small country. Uh, so I think the the coordination with different organizations and the referral mechanism that we were able to to uh, all of us to support uh, has made a great difference in the lives of people. Now, the, for the referral mechanism specifically, because we, 
panera on its own cannot do any you know, everything uh, but at the same time we can help people maybe that can that other organizations cannot help so with a referral mechanism that is going getting stronger and stronger because we are feeling that we need to work together at the end of the day uh, it, it's it's uh, doing a lot of of help um, uh, for example uh, we are we are getting referrals for food security for uh, medication uh, because we have a project with the uh, um, State Department and uh, for uh, vocational training. We, we are getting thousands, and I'm not uh, uh, exaggerating, thousands uh, of referrals every week because people want, want help and they, they uh, don't always have um, a, a, a way for them to express their needs. And the more that we are activating the referral mechanism from one organization to another or people to self-refer themselves, uh, the, the more we are able to help people. Well, I mean, again, that speaks to the power of, of partnership, collaboration, and, and, and networking to make sure that, you know, we're, we're pulling together that social safety network that, that everybody needs um, and, and, and linking people to the right services at the right time. I mean, that's the, I mean, information is key there, certainly. Um, I mean, as we sort of wrap up, we've, we've got about five minutes left. Um, I mean, Rami, maybe you can kind of talk a little bit about uh, what we as an international medical, as an international community can do to strengthen the response um, in countries like Lebanon with that, that are dealing with long-term emergencies, plural, um, as, as Dima said. Um, and, you know, what would you leave the audience with, like what those actions are? Three uh, very fast things. So one, in uh, building up to Dima's, uh, Dima's point on the coordination, I think when a country is facing so many crises at different levels, we need to revisit and review the responses that are present here. This starts with reviewing the assessment, having a nationwide assessment, and then having a coordinated and a coherent response that includes all of the crises and the responses that we that we have. We have four current responses. And even within World Vision Lebanon, my second point is that within World Vision Lebanon, we actually did this change. So we had four different responses that are happening at the same time. And we came to ourselves and we said, OK, so uh, if we're looking at a sustained uh, crisis, we need to have a sustained humanitarian response. And this is what we called it. And we combined four different crises and one uh, or four, four different response plans and one response. And then we had the country strategy for World Vision. It is the response plan that is actually implementing, that we're implementing under and that we're, uh, that we're having our interventions in. This is much more uh, agile, as Dr. Abia said. It shows that we are always as well in a dynamic, uh, so a dynamic context. We're supporting our context analysis, we're supporting our uh, needs analysis and all of this. Uh, my third point is that within World Vision as well, we have something called the Fragile Context Program Approach. This is a, an approach that we use in Fragile Context, similar to Lebanon, although we tweaked it a little bit and how we are, how we are implementing those mo this module. But this helps in context monitoring. So we have tools that, that monitor the context on a regular basis. And then we have uh, scenario planning. We design our interventions based on contingency planning and based on the plans that we put within each of our projects and as well in maximizing the impact. So we review the strategy on a yearly basis to see what kind of things we need to change. And this pro this a module actually has three uh, different levels. It has the survive, the adapt, and the strive. And these three uh, modules, or we call them dials, each one of them has different kinds of interventions. So it's kind of, it kind of gives a certain aspect of you know pick and choose, uh, contextualize to what needs to be contextualized, and then start with the uh, with the implementation directly on the field of the people. Thank you. But that's not necessarily uh, a direct um, connection no. between point A to point Z, right? Um, sometimes it's a little cyclical and sometimes you need to you take a step back, right? And before you can move forward. How, how do you, how, how, I mean, just 
annually reviewing it? Is that it? Or are there some built-in kind of, um, I don't know, tripwires that sort of, you know, tell you when you have to go back or move forward? 2017, 2018 was, uh, we were starting, you know, to go into the ADAPT and then the 2019 crisis happened and then COVID-19. So we went back to survive and it relies on the context monitoring tool. Right. So in all of the tools that we use in order to see what, whether the situation is going worse or whether the situation is going better or whether, whether the situation is actually constant. And based on these scenarios, we see, do we need to go to a, a dial forward or do we need to go to a dial backward and amend our interventions? So this is basically the concept that we that we work in, and it includes the the most important part of it is it includes all of the team members. So the meetings that we do, for example, it's not only for the projects; it's also for the department and the support functions. And here, finance is involved, procurement is involved, logistics and and admin are involved, uh, me are involved, and it tackles the organization on an organizational level and also the programmatic level, which is directly impacting the uh, the community. Right, okay. Um, and Dima, I mean, what would you say that we can do to strengthen the response in countries like Lebanon that have these multiple crises and sustained emergencies? I agree a lot with, uh, with what Rami already said, but I want to say that it's very important for to have flexibility as our like big title and not to have plan A and plan B. We should have no plan. We should have actually, uh, uh, plan A to Z. It's, uh, it's that much uh, difficult for us to operate in Lebanon. We should have a plan B for every plan B. Uh, so, uh, so it's very important for us to have the ability to, to pivot uh, our programming uh, uh, towards current uh, crises. I can remember very well when uh, the Beirut blast happened. Um, it was a horrible day for, for everyone in Lebanon. Uh, for us in, in our office, it was destroyed. Uh, and uh, in our houses. So it was really, really a shock for all of us. It took us maybe um, the next day when we started to realize that it's, it's a very big thing uh, to pivot uh, you know, within, I think 48 hours, we, put, we pivoted all of our projects towards uh, responding to Beirut blast. Uh, like you can imagine how, for example, vocational training courses can be pivoted towards uh, uh, helping uh, people reconstruct their houses. Uh, the, the students that, uh, for example, take uh, um, building construction trades classes, uh, or for uh, for uh, the cooking students to help people who were displaced from their houses, uh, nursing students to help in, in uh, treating uh, the injured. So, so with that, I think the flexibility that Anera's management had, and also our our donors, was very important. I want to give another example of of. Uh, uh, a practice that I love with, with some of our donors is that they uh, uh, provide us with contingency funds uh, that are built into the, the budget of every project, uh, which is a small, small contingency fund, for example, like three or, or two percent or four percent of the total budget for immediate uh, 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 activation in case of an emergency uh, during the project period. And they do controls over these uh, budgets because we can only use them under their approval, but they can give approval immediately. They don't, they don't have to go through all the bureaucracy of approvals. So I think these are practical solutions for donors and for organizations to, to, ha to have in place uh, that can help people like me who are frontliners uh, do their job much better. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's so interesting that you gave those examples. I mean, I think that that's exactly what Dr. Abiyat was trying to, to emphasize in his remarks is that while you are delivering services, you also have to focus on the health system strengthening part. And, and that's exactly uh, what you describe there while you're responding to the needs of the, of the people affected by the blast. You're also, um, you know, focusing on vocational skills training for youth, which was a, which is what I think a lot of people would see as a development act activity, as opposed to a humanitarian response activity. But really, um, you know, making sure that we're uh, marrying the two when possible, um, and having that kind of dual outcome where you're building uh, skills of the community as well as responding to their needs. And I think and that's brilliant. 
Brilliant. I think this is very important also to, to think of, but not of, of humanitarian and development as two separate things. Right. Uh, I believe that with every humanitarian emergency, there is potential for us to build something for the future, to make our system better, to face uh, similar or different crises in the future. So, so for, for us, for example, we are leveraging our medical donations, imagine, to uh, uh, install solar power uh, um, installations for healthcare centers. So, so we are, and and we were able to to um, uh, complement these for medical donations for to for people to be able to store medicines properly. But not uh, only that; it will be serving them for a longer term, and of course for the environmental factor uh, in that sense. Right, right. Um, I, I mean, I think that that's so important. I guess I would say, as a as moderator, uh, one of my takeaways would be. Um, and one of the things that I would let the audience to take away is that um, it's it's not a linear experience, right? Um, it can be cyclical, and that at, while we're responding to these tremendous needs, um, that the everyone from donors, private sector actors to NGOs and civil, local civil society organizations should really be focusing on strengthening that local capacity so that people are better prepared uh, and able to take care of themselves and, and, and their families and, and people in their community. And so I think, you know, when you see uh, a, you know, a crisis kind of unfolding, um, really supporting those, those efforts that do both um, simultaneously, I think is a really uh, key lesson that we've all learned from, from our decades of responding in, in, in these humanitarian crisis environments. Um, so I think, you know, we'll, we'll leave it there. Uh, and um, I, I think, uh, Sean, I think you and I are coming back together to kind of pose this one question to the audience. Um, how can PQMD continue to advance collaborative opportunities for members and non-members to work together to bring measurable health impact to these underserved and vulnerable communities? Um, so we're just asking you all to sort of free form, uh, share your ideas about how PQMD can, can sort of advance these uh, opportunities for members. Um, any ideas? I don't know, Sean, if you want to share any thoughts. Well, one thing I'd, I'd love to do uh, while people are thinking about this and, and writing it out is, is check back in with, uh, with Dr. Aviad if he has any. Is he still with us? He may have gone off for, to do IFTAR uh, at sundown. I think we, we may have lost him. Okay. No, I'd like to hear from folks. And thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Dima and, and Rami. That was an excellent conversation. Thank you very much. I think, um, I mean, EJ, you might also have some thoughts. I mean, I, th I think the forums that PUPMD creates to have these kinds of dialogues are really important. And I know that we have, um, you know, more uh, coming. Um, one of my jobs is actually to plug uh, next Tuesday's um, uh, final Global Health Policy Forum Roundtable on Africa. Uh, and that session is titled Expanding Resiliency, a Hopeful Story of Creative Leadership in Responding to the Compounding Challenges of the Pandemic. Um, so I hope everyone will join us uh, next Tuesday, uh, April 26th, same time, uh, 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, I think that this, these kinds of um, conversations are really important to uh, really kind of um, together understanding the nature of the problems that we face, the challenges, what people need, um, keeping people, um, families at the center of, of the services that we're providing, um, and developing those kind of longer term partnerships that are going to help move us forward. Um, so just wanted to uh, thank everyone. It's been a really incredible day um, so far. Um, thank you, Sean, for bringing Dr. Abdiya for us. I mean, it was such great remarks. It was really wonderful to hear from him. Uh, Rami, Dima, you um, are both superstars. Uh, really grateful for your time and the perspectives that you shared today. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities for us to continue um, these conversations and to continue to, to collaborate together. Um, as always, the um, phenomenal PQMD team will be posting the recording of this session on the community of practice. I hope um, everyone continues to use that as a resource. 
Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention um, is that uh, while we're meeting virtually um, next year, we are planning uh, to meet in person. Um, so I wanted to um, have people kind of pencil in on their calendar early, um, uh, the return of our in-person Global Health Policy Forum, um, which will be taking place in Paris, France, uh, hosted by Toulouse. And um, you know, next April, uh, April 24th through the 27th in 2023. Um, so it'll be a great opportunity to see each other in person uh, and really advance um, these conversations. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us today and um, like to officially close this session and, and wish you all a, a great week. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you, EJ, everyone. Victoria, thanks a lot. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.